Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Dutra, and this is our Blackstone Valley. It has come to our attention that a mysterious force is loose somewhere in outer space. The mysteries of creation are there. Up in the sky? Up in the sky. The moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Welcome back, everyone. Before we cover some news, I wanted to send a special shout out to everybody watching at the Valley Tavern. I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, here's our mission statement for a not-for-profit I helped start here in Northbridge. It's called Our Northbridge. Uh, the mission statement is, first off, feed the children. Not just food, knowledge. Make our town the pride of the Blackstone Valley in primary and secondary education. Secondly, clean up the streets. Not just litter, the economic challenges in the commons of Whitensville and in Rockdale. And help establish a park and recreation department to protect and uh, improve our public spaces. Lastly, fire the bad actors. Find out who is responsible for the challenges we currently face in town and then replace them. Furthermore, establish term limits for elected officials so it never happens again. If you'd like to be involved with us, please uh, text me or call me at 401 486-6894, or message me on Facebook. Our first story tonight is on taking a knee, uh, why are NFL players protesting, and when did they start to kneel? Critics say that sports should be clear of politics, but athletes have used their platform to protest before. Uh, this was originally covered by Clark Mindick of The Independent. After a wave of players joined in on American football player Colin Kaepernick's protest movement against police brutality last year, morphing the protest into somewhat of a direct resistance against President Trump after he weighed in on the issue, the NFL has now announced that teams will be fined if players take a knee during the national anthem. The contentious move to take a knee during the national anthem before a game or stand locked in arms in silent protests follows in a long tradition of sports stars standing up for what they believe in to be right. But some charge it as unpatriotic and that politics should be kept out of sports. Here's what you need to know. Kaepernick's protest first occurred, occurred 21 months ago, but was not immediately noticed. At that point, he simply sat on the bench during the U.S. National Anthem during a preseason game, uh, just next to some giant Gatorade jugs. But later, he transitioned to taking a knee in protest, saying he was doing so uh, to show more respect for military veterans after meeting with uh, a former service member, a veteran who got published in the Military Times, commenting on it. Uh, it turned out to be a much more iconic pose. Several other players joined in on the protest, even though they received a lot of criticism from football fans who said that this was disrespectful to the United States. Still, the movement did not gain huge traction that year. Uh, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. Kaepernick said this in a press conference after first sitting out during the, uh, sitting out the anthem. To me, this is bigger than football and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. What is the context surrounding those first protests? Police brutality has become an incredibly polarizing and contentious issue in American life. This has come as a result of repeated videos showing police shooting and killing unarmed black men, which have been posted online and gone viral, illustrating the brutality that Black people in America must contend with when dealing with some police officers who often do not serve any prison time for pulling the trigger. Uh, why is this gaming, gaining steam now? President Trump became a catalyst for the protest in September when he said during a campaign rally in Alabama that he wished that NFL players would be fired for kneeling during the national anthem. Uh, he can be quoted saying, wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag saying, get that son of a off the field right now, he's fired. President Trump said, you know, some owner's gonna do that. He's gonna say, that guy disrespects our flag, he's fired. And that owner, they don't know it, but they'll be the most popular person in the country. Obviously, after an inflammatory, uh, inflammatory quote like that, things uh, only began to get worse. Who is protesting? 
Some football teams chose not to come out on the field after all of uh, President Trump's comments, while other teams allowed their players to protest at their own discretion. In addition to most, if not all, of the NFL teams seeing some players protesting the weekend after President Trump's September remarks, baseball professionals and basketball professionals also joined in. Notably, Patriots quarterback Tom Brady called President Trump's comments divisive and locked arms with his teammates during the game following the president's remarks. Brady has remained mostly silent about President Trump, whom he has called a friend in the past. Why exactly is this such a big deal for people? President Trump charges that kneeling during the national anthem is disrespectful to American servicemen and women, which he is not one of other than being the commander in chief right now. He's never served one day, uh, just as a point, as do many of his supporters. The White House has repeatedly attempted to rebrand the protest as a protest of the American flag instead of against police brutality and racism and oppression overall in the United States. After Kaepernick first started the protest, he was criticized for introducing politics into sports. Many said that football was somehow sacrosanct and that it should be a place where people can rise above politics. But is it abnormal for sports stars to make their political opinions known during events? No, not really. There's a rich history in American sports stars wading into the political sphere. For instance, John Carlos and Tommy Smith made headlines across the world when they raised the Black Power salute on the podium after winning in the 1968 Olympics. That protest brought them death threats, and they were expelled from the games. Muhammad Ali is perhaps one of the best-known American athletes to take a major political stand. While not a direct stand against racism, Ali refused to be drafted into the Vietnam War, a refusal that involved jail time. He did so on, his base, on basis of his personal faith, he said, but he did note the cruel irony of asking black men to serve in Vietnam for a country that has treated them as subhuman. More recently, NBA players like Lebr LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and others helped the Black Lives Matter movement pick up steam by wearing supportive shirts following the death of Eric Garner, who was choked to death in New York. So what is the new NFL rule? NFL owners unanimously approved the new national anthem policy this week, requiring players to stand if they are on the field during the performance of the song. Players do have the option to remain in the locker room during the anthem if they prefer. If a player or other employee of a team kneels or sits during the anthem, the teams themselves are fined. The teams then have the option to find the individual players or personnel for the infraction. The vote was unanimous, but the owner of the San Francisco 49ers, the team Kaepernick played for when he started the protest, abstained from the vote. The rule will be added to the NFL's game operations manual and will therefore not be subject to collective bargaining agreements. The NFL Players Association has said it will review the policy and challenge any aspect of the rule that if it does in fact violating the collective bargaining agreement between the players and the employees. So what happened to Colin Kaepernick? Kaepernick is not currently on any NFL team even though many of his supporters argue that he is good enough to be picked up by a team. He has said himself that he is ready to play uh, if any team is willing to hire him. But while Kaepernick is out of his NFL job, he has remained busy with charity work. That includes a $1 million pledge he has made to charitable organizations, which has included support for a variety of groups. Kaepernick has largely refused to comment on the most recent NFL protest and has refra uh, refrained from responding to President Trump's criticism of the protest movement he started as unpatriotic. What does this all mean for you at home? Um, this is a form of protest and civil disobedience. And it is my opinion we should try to support the players doing this to show solidarity. Um, what is civil disobedience? Civil disobedience is the refusal to comply with certain laws or to pay taxes or fines as a peaceful form of political protest. Many people in history have been part of civil disobedience to bring about awareness and change where they see injustice. People like Rosa Parks, David Richmond, and Phil Radford. Rosa Parks was not protesting the bus. David Richmond was not protesting the lunch counter. Phil Radford was not protesting cranes. Colin Kaepernick was not protesting the flag or our national anthem. Furthermore, anyone who's ever watched him play knows he's good enough to play and should be able to. He is certainly better than half the quarterbacks in the NFL and greatly outpaces the bottom of the QBs in the NFL. He's certainly better than the game manager Trevor Simeon in Denver or the huge rookie disappointment Mitchell Trubisky in Chicago. And lastly, 
just like with the bunch, the, the excuse me, the, the bus and the lunch counter and climate change protests, they will only get stronger and more vocal until they are heard and their grievances dealt with. I'm Mike Dutra. This is our Blackstone Valley. We'll be right back. The wisest person I ever met in my life, a third grade dropouts. Wisest and dropout in the same sentence is rather oxymoronic, like jumbo shrimp. Mm-hmm. Like fun run. Ain't nothing fun about it. Like Microsoft works. Y'all don't hear me. I used to say like country music, but I've lived in Texas so long. I, I love country music now. I, that, yeah. I hunt, I fish, I have cowboy boots and cowboy. Y'all, I'm a black neck, red neck. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? No longer oxymoronic for me to say country music. And it's not oxymoronic for me to say third grade and dropout. That third grade dropout, the wisest person I ever met in my life who taught me to combine knowledge and wisdom to make an impact was my father. A simple cook, wisest man I ever met in my life. Just a simple cook. Left school in the third grade to help out on the family farm, but just because he left school doesn't mean his education stopped. Mark Twain once said, I've never allowed my schooling to get in the way of my education. My father taught himself how to read, taught himself how to write, decided in the midst of Jim Crowism, as America was breathing the last gasp of the Civil War, my father decided he was gonna stand and be a man. Not a black man, not a brown man, not a white man, but a man. He literally challenged himself to be the best that he could all the days of his life. I have four degrees. My brother is a judge. We're not the smartest ones in our family. It's a third grade dropout daddy. A, a third grade dropout daddy who was quoting Michelangelo, saying to us, boys, I won't have a problem if you aim high and miss, but I'm gonna have a real issue if you aim low and hit. A, a country mother quoting Henry Ford, saying if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. I learned that from a third grade drop, simple lessons. Lessons like these, son, you'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. We never knew what time it was at my house because the clocks were always ahead. My mother said for nearly 30 years, my father left the house at 3.45 in the morning. One day she asked him, why daddy? He said, maybe one of my boys will catch me in the act of excellence. I want to share two things with you. Aristotle said, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit, not an act. Don't ever forget that. I know you're tough, but always remember to be kind. Always. Don't ever forget that. Never embarrass mama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If daddy ain't happy, don't nobody care. But you know, I'm trying to tell you. Next lesson. Lesson from a cook over there in the galley. Son, make sure your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Y'all might have a relative in mind you want to send that to. Let me say it again. <laughs> Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Pride is the burden of a foolish person. John Wooden coached basketball at UCLA for a living. But his calling was to impact people. And with all those national championships, guess what he was found doing in the middle of the week? Going into the cupboard, grabbing a broom, and sweeping his own gym floor. You want to make an impact? Find your broom. Every day of your life, you find your broom. You grow your influence that way. That way you're attracting people so that you can impact them. Final lesson. Son, if you're going to do a job, do it right. I've always been told how average I can be. Always been criticized about being average. But I want to tell you something. I stand here before you, before all of these people, not listening to those words, but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars, to be the best that I can be. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better, and better isn't good enough if it can be best. Let me close with a very personal story that I think will bring all this into focus. Wisdom will come to you in the unlikeliest of sources, a lot of times through failure. When you hit rock bottom, remember this. While you're struggling, rock bottom can also be a great foundation on which to build. 
and on which to grow. I'm not worried that you'll be successful. I'm worried that you won't fail from time to time. The person that gets up off the canvas and keeps growing, that's the person that will continue to grow their influence. Back in the 70s, to help me make this point, let me introduce you to someone. I met the finest woman I'd ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. Back in my day, we'd have called her a brick house. <laughs> this woman was the finest woman I'd ever seen in my life. There's just one little problem. Back then, ladies didn't like big old linemen. The blind side hadn't come out yet. <laughs> they, they like quarterbacks and running backs. We're at this dance, and I find out her name is Trina Williams from Lompoc, California. And, and we, we're all dancing, and we're, we're just, just excited. And I decide in the middle of dancing with her that I would ask her for her phone number. She, Trina was the first one. Trina was the only woman in college who gave me her real telephone number. <laughs> the next day, we walked to Baskin and Robbins Ice Cream Parlor. My friends couldn't believe it. This has been 40 years ago, and my friends still can't believe it. We go on a second date, and a third date, and a fourth date. Mm-hmm. We drive from Chico to Vallejo so that she could meet my parents. My father meets her, my daddy, my hero. He meets her, pulls me to the side and says, is she psycho? But anyway. <laughs> We go together for a year, two years, three years, four years. By now, Trina's a senior in college. I'm still a freshman, but I'm working some things out. I'm so glad I graduated in four terms. Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan. So now it's, it's, it's time to propose. So I talk to her girlfriends, and it's California. It's in the 70s, so it has to be outside. You have to have a candle, and you have to have you know, some chocolate. And listen, I'm from the hood. I had a bottle of Boone's Farm wine. That's what I had. She said yes. That was the key. I married the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. Y'all ever been to a wedding? And even before the wedding starts, you hear this. How in the world? and it was coming from my side of the family. <laughs> we get married, we have a few children, our lives are great. One day, Trina finds a lump in her left breast. Breast cancer. Six years after that diagnosis, me and my two little boys walked up to mommy's casket. And for two years, my heart didn't beat. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. If it wasn't for those two little boys, there would have been no reason for which to go on. I was completely lost. That was rock bottom. You know what sustained me? The wisdom of a third grade dropout. The wisdom of a simple cook. We're at the casket. I'd never seen my dad cry. But this time I saw my dad cry. That was his daughter. Trina was his daughter, not his daughter-in-law. And I'm right behind my father about to see her for the last time on this earth. And my father shared three words with me that changed my life right there at the casket. It would be the last lesson he would ever teach me. He said, son, just stand. You keep standing. You keep standing, no matter how rough the sea, you keep standing. And I'm not talking about just water. You keep standing. No matter what, you don't give up. And as clearly as I'm talking to you today, these were some of her last words to me. She looked me in the eye and she said, it doesn't matter to me any longer how long I live. What matters to me most is how I live. I ask you all one question, a question that I was asked all my life by a third grade dropout. How you living? How you living? Every day, ask yourself that question, how you living? Here's, here's what a cook would suggest you to live this way. That you would not judge, that you would show up early, that you'd be kind, that you'd make sure that that servant's town is huge and used. That if you're gonna do something, you do it the right way. That, that, that cook would tell you this, that it's never wrong to do the right thing. That how you do anything, is how you do everything. And in that way, you will grow your influence to make an impact. In that way, you will honor all those who have gone before you, who have invested in you. Look in those unlikeliest places for wisdom. Enhance your life every day. 
by seeking that wisdom and asking yourself every night, how am I living? May God richly bless y'all. Thank you for having me. I'm Mike Dutra, and this is our Blackstone Valley. Tonight, a couple things I'd like to talk about with you privately. What's going on in town? Why are people so afraid of change? If you live in Massachusetts, and you live in Northbridge, and you want to act like you live in some backwoods town in Alabama, I have some very serious questions for you. Are you aware it's 2018? Are you aware that Meghan Markle is a princess, and she's just human. She's everything. Do you understand the challenges we face in town have so much to do with race and gender? Locally, nationally, are you willing to be part of the conversation? Sitting at home and saying, not in my backyard, there isn't any racism here, is a huge part of the problem. You need to consider the following. What are you doing to make a difference? What does your family talk about at the dinner table? Are you more worried about talking about the president or the past presidents than you are talking about how our child's day was or if they got lunch? These are things we need to talk about. More than that, what I'd like to share with you now is a simple proposition. Not one more vote, not one more bomb drops, not one more decision. Not until every child is fed, every woman is safe, everyone has a roof over their head and then we can get right back to dropping bombs on each other. But first, can we stop acting like we live in a cave? Can we take a moment and reflect on the idea that we are a lifetime away, perhaps, from being an interplanetary species like Stephen Hawking talks about? Are you aware that our children, I'm 38 years old, I firmly believe my son's going to get off this planet. I talk with him about that stuff all the time. What are you talking with your kids about? Are you talking with them about the bullies in school and what they say to kids that are developmentally delayed or kids that experience emotional disturbances? Or are you more worried about shaming your son into traditional gender roles and telling your daughter that she's not good at math because she's a girl? These are questions you got to ask yourself. Because if you think you're going to get anything from me other than what you've been getting, I promise you you're going to be really disappointed because it's only going to get worse from here. We need to stop giving deadbeat dad answers for our children. I have three children, two different baby mothers. I often joke with my children and say, one of you is the mansion, one of you is the yacht, and one of you is the trip around the world once a year. Because that's what it costs to raise a family in this modern economy. And for a single woman out there doing it on her own with a deadbeat dad on the other side of the equation, we should worship these women. We should take care of them and their children, not shame them and tell them having a child is wrong and explain to them that the responsibilities begin and end with them and it's not their body if they don't want to have the baby, but the moment that baby comes out, the man doesn't have to do anything. He can just move to Florida and completely get washed away of responsibility. I want you to think about these things. Lastly, consider the following. You're going to die someday. When you do, people are going to talk about your life. Not about you going to some puffy cloud in the sky. They're going to talk about the things you did, the things you wish you did, the people you loved, the people that loved you. If you're not thinking about those things every single day, you're going to be very sad when your time comes. You need to get focused on more important stuff. We'll be right back. What is evil? Traditional conceptions of evil focus on the utter monstrosity of evil actions, the complete awe and unthinkability of horror. Called pure or radical evil, this is the sort of evil associated with antagonists or villains. It is the antithesis of good. 
For Hannah Arendt, a German Jewish philosopher, evil is not always as simple as an overriding desire to do no good. Rather, Arendt chooses to focus a discussion of evil on this man, Adolf Eichmann. Put on trial for numerous horrors, Eichmann was found guilty of crimes against humanity, especially against the Jewish people, for overseeing the trains that transported people to Nazi death camps. On May 31, 1962, he was hanged. Arendt traveled to Jerusalem to cover the Eichmann trial. She expected to encounter a cold, calculating monster, a man who reveled in his malicious deeds. Instead, what she found was something far more shocking. Eichmann was an altogether innocuous and seemingly normal little man. In some sense, he was a cliché, a stereotypical bureaucrat, a sort of sleepwalker in life, a person who refused to comprehend the weight of his crimes. Eichmann wasn't afflicted with an overriding sense of maliciousness. Instead, what Arendt found was a man that was thoughtless, that never stopped to put himself in someone else's shoes, that refused to think from another's perspective. She found someone with an unquestioning sense of obligation to authority, who all his life had been a follower, a person eager to fit in and be led. He suffered from blind allegiance and a complete self-deception about the morality of his actions. This made Arendt rethink the concept of evil, for Eichmann wasn't a demon in any obvious way. What she encountered was the banality of evil, an everyday sort of evil, a bureaucrat eager to do his job, one who lacked empathy or perspective. You don't need to be cruel, sadistic, or vicious to embody evil. All that a person has to do is blindly follow the orders of another person. For Arendt, that is the banality of evil. So, dear viewer, what can be done to save humanity from mindless obedience? Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Mike Dutra, and this is our Blackstone Valley. I'm going to talk next with you about... Uh, the peculiarities of the Confederate Yankees, a great write-up that one of my friends turned me on to that couples again something I've talked with you about before called fake patriotism. It's an idea that if you are someone who's very, like, uh, not just President Trump, but someone who's fervently patriotic and hates illegals or Islam, um, but more importantly, you're really much more likely to just be a white man over the age of 40 um, who's struggling financially, these are the questions we got to start asking ourselves. If you're trying to use the American flag to attack refugees, which are women and children without a nation, I have a big problem with that. Moreover, if you try to couple your patriotism against anything other than service to our great nation, not only as a soldier or a sailor or a Marine or an airman or airwoman, you could be a teacher, a fireman, a paramedic. There's so many things we need in America. But if you work at Speedway and you have on a Make America Great Again hat, I have a problem with it. And here's why. Patriotism, the whole idea of nationalism, stems back to the citizen soldier. People that are fiercely patriotic about their country are people willing to fight and die for that country. And if I'm talking to you right now and you're a veteran or you've ever served or you tried to serve and you were turned away or you're a teacher or a fireman or someone who serves society, a garbage man, I am not talking about you. If you are someone who lives off of society in any way, if you are a recipient of any type of social service, you need to stop using the flag to hurt other people. If you are someone who just has a regular job or, God forbid, owns your own business, you need to stop attacking people that just want to live here and trying to shame them and saying terrible things about them. The world is moving faster every day. We're seeing more and more stories like the lawyer that tried to call ICE on that lovely young woman ultimately being shamed out of existence. We see another a lieutenant for the fire department being shamed out of existence, uh, the, federal, the, excuse me, the fire department out of New York. More and more stories like this where people are being forced to live with the awful things they've said either in real life, on camera, or online. These are the things for you to think about. If you were more excited to see Donald Trump become president, 
than you were Barack Obama. Can you please ask yourself why? Barack Obama, to me, is the Jackie Robinson of American presidents. He will go down in history perhaps not as the greatest baseball player ever or greatest president ever, perhaps someday in the future not even the greatest African-American president. Oprah, if you're watching, please run. Please, Oprah, we all love you. Give us all cars and books. I'm kidding. Oprah, run. You can stand up to this guy. But getting back to the point of the Jackie Robinson of, of presidents, Barack Obama certainly faced death threats and racism, not only himself, but his wife and two little girls. You want to talk about real bravery? I say former President Barack Obama is one of the bravest people alive in America today. He took a great risk trying to make the world a better place, trying to bring people health care, which if you look at the way the world is right now, we've got even more serious problems in health care. The school shootings, what happened in Santa Fe, I'm not going to shame anybody. But if you have guns on your Facebook, if you're, if you're on Facebook doing crazy NRA stunts, taking pictures of yourself with tons of weapons, if you're a Trumper who uses Make America Great Again to try to Islamophobe or um, homophobe or attack other races, if you're a white nationalist, if you're any of these things, you need to leave America now. We don't want you here. We would much rather have people from the caravan who come all the way up from El Salvador trying to make their families' lives better than have you. We don't need hatred in America. We need answers. Coming up, I'm going to actually be with my friend Giovanni Froshi, who's a candidate for governor in Rhode Island, amazing self-made man, someone you're going to want to hear his story. Uh, beyond that, we're going to have other great guests on, like Sabrina from our Northbridge, who's going to explain to you the groundbreaking work she's doing trying to help women who are victims of domestic violence here in the Blackstone Valley, particularly in our great town of Northbridge. Beyond that, something I want to talk with you about personally is my own story. Having the opportunity to explain to you who I am and what I do is something I, I covered briefly before, but I'd like to cover it all once now if I can. Um, after I graduated high school, I went to college at the University of Albany, dropped out of college, moved back home, went in the Marines. My enlistment date was October 12, 2000. I went in the United States Marine Corps Reserves as a 5711, which is a nuclear biological chemical defense specialist. After going to my initial active duty training, I came home, did my one weekend a month, two weeks a year, until Iraq. I was activated for the Iraq War. When I came home, went back in the reserves, had an opportunity to become a Marine officer, turned that down because I wanted to marry this beautiful young woman who had this little boy that I loved like my own, we got married. I ended up going into the Army National Guard because they offered me a commission as well. And then I didn't have to leave. I could stay, I could stay here locally in the Rhode Island Army National Guard. Got my commission, graduated honor grad, got to speak at the State House. Um, Ron Tamro and Captain Dean, if you're out there, please just let me say thank you. Uh, Captain Maldonado, anybody I'm forgetting, you men are the standard. Thank you for setting the standard. After getting my commission, um, if, right after I got my commission, my mother was terminally diagnosed with cancer. Um, my focus completely shifted to her and her three children that were still in school. My brother, Stephen, who's a, uh, a captain in the United States Army now. Steve, how's it going, buddy? Uh, he was at PC as a freshman at the time. We were completely focused on the family. I had to put my own career as an officer on hold. Uh, shortly after my mother passed, I resigned my commission, um, among other things. But not too much later, I ended up living in a million dollar house on the beach, uh, three side ocean views, beautiful baby boy, life was good. Uh, from there, I ended up getting divorced, uh, got a little condo at a place called Kirkbrae Country Club for a while. From there, bought a house in our beautiful town of Northbridge. Uh, I live in the 01588 up in the hills. Absolutely love it there. Anybody who lives in my neighborhood knows I, I have lots of kids. I don't keep the cleanest yard. I have, you know, I don't cut my grass as much as I should. But I try really hard to be neighborly and do important stuff, like keep, you know, keep especially the front yard really nice. Stuff we really want to be more focused on as a town. We need to start having these open conversations of, well, what's the most important thing in town? If you think how long you lived here is more important than how you behave, I feel like we need to talk more, a lot more. It doesn't matter if your great-great-grandfather landed on Northbridge Rock or landed on Rockdale, 
you have no more rights than a person who just moved here that just took up residency. We are the exactly the same people. We live in a little town in Massachusetts outside of Boston. A lot of people are moving here commuting to Boston, and this weird backwoods Confederate Yankee stuff ended the day I came forward and outed school committee chairman like Mike Labrasso. We all know that. The town's going in a new direction. It's time for change. Something we're all going to have to look into is I was written in for two positions in elected office in town. We're going to be talking about that probably in the coming weeks. I'm going to a selectman's meeting to find out exactly how that works. Uh, something else you'll want to know is the, the uh, not-for-profit I'm still involved with is very interested in pulling papers on every vacant position in town during the next election. Uh, congratulations on the two votes. Uh, voting no on one. I want to send uh, a special thank you to everyone who showed up and voted. People that I went and knocked on their doors and said, please go vote, and you did. Thank you so much. Uh, getting the Community Preservation Act passed was a landmark, landmark win for common sense town management. We need to keep Northbridge green. I didn't move here to move to Shrewsbury. I moved here because this is the heart of the Blackstone Valley. This is the most beautiful place I've ever lived, and I've lived a few places. West End Creamery is my favorite place to take the kids. Fafama Farm is probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen that I get to live close to. Why don't we talk about that stuff more? Why don't we talk about the corruption we face in town on one side, but more importantly, how we have this amazing, amazing town full of all these people that really love it here and if we can focus on cleaning up d street and i guess main street in rockdale or just really like you know rockdale proper and the commons this is going to be one of the most desirable places to live i'll say in america why can't we have solutions based conversations why does it always have to be a conflict where people like me come forward and are identified as high profile residents simply because i know how to carry on a conversation with somebody and say well i, I love you but i respectfully disagree a lot of other people in town have taken a very different position where I don't love you, I hate you, and if you disagree with me, I'm going to send internet trolls after you or stuff like that, and I, I just don't, I don't agree with that. Let me tell you why. If you're so sure in your position, argue your position. Some of the greatest debates in American history have happened with two people who fervently felt they were right. The Supreme Court talks about this all the time. Ruth Gate Bader Ginsburg is probably one of the smartest women walking the earth today. She debates people all the time trying to understand her decisions before she votes, before she decides as, as a Supreme Court justice. Um, justice Scalia, uh, God rest his soul, before he went, made brilliant, brilliant orations and arguments on either side of either argument, simply trying to help people understand where we were as a country. Uh, one of the things I want to touch on as well is health care. Um, I think the fact that we live in a country that is like Papua New Guinea when it comes to how we treat women when they're pregnant and when they're trying to be at home with their baby is abhorrent. I think not only do we need to get back to Obamacare, we need to move to a single-payer system. Um, other things you may want to know about me, I am a progressive liberal, but I have many progressive conservative friends. I do look at a lot of stuff like... Uh, money management as equally important to social responsibilities because if you don't have the money to fix stuff you can't do anything uh, expanding upon that uh, I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin if you read about money modern money mechanics which is something that's uh, been written by the Federal Reserve it talks about velocity velocity has to do with inflation it means the more money that gets into circulation the faster money moves the less it becomes worth so what I'm proposing to you is Every time some young man or woman that's flat out brilliant invents the next Bitcoin, every dollar we have becomes worth less than it was before. We'll be right back. Hi, it's Guy Kawasaki. And in today's episode of Wise Guy, we're going to talk about how to start a company. So the first thing you need to do when you start a company is not plan for this future where you control the world, where you're a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple. You ask very simple questions to start a company. Is there a better way? Isn't this interesting? I mean, think of Steve and Woz when they started Apple. They didn't have this plan for personal computers and iPhones, iPods, iPads, Apple stores. They asked a very simple question. 
But why is it that to use a personal computer, I have to work for a large company, a university, the government? Why can't I have a personal computer that is small and cheap and easy? And they started Apple. So step number one in starting a company is to ask simple questions. Step number two is to make an MVVVP. Now, most of you have heard of the MVP, which is the minimum viable product. I would like to add two more V's. So the V I want to add to viable is valuable. That is, you're doing something that's important. You could make something that's viable, i.e., you make money doing it, but it's not necessarily valuable. And the last V I'd like to add is validation. Does it validate your vision? You see the world evolving in a certain way. So you want to make this product that is viable, obviously. You want to be in business. Is it valuable? Is it making a dent in the universe? And finally, does it validate what you're thinking? So make an MVVVP, not simply an MVP. The third thing you need to do is find soulmates. And by soulmates, I mean people who agree with you on sort of two levels. Uh, one level is that you have the same perspective that you know, for each person, this company is the meaning of their life, that they're going to dedicate their life to it. Or it's a part-time job, it's an experiment, it's a hobby. You need to be on the same place because if somebody considers the company a hobby and somebody else considers it their life goal, there's going to be a lot of problems. And this is what... what and this is what I mean by soulmate, that you're on the, the same page, you're singing from the same sheet of music, okay? The fourth thing is to define a business model. Now, your business model may change, it may go haywire, uh, you may pivot, you may do all these kind of things, but at the start, you need some kind of rough approximation. Are you in the software business? Uh, are you charging per hour? Are you in the service business? Are you a consulting business? Are you going to be in the advertising business where you need to get a large installed base and then you can advertise to them? Are you going to be the freemium model where you give away some stuff for free, but you charge them, you charge your customers to use you know, a different version? So you need to wrap your mind around some business model. Again, you'll probably change it, but you need to start somewhere. You can't just say, we'll worry about that later. You need to keep that going in your mind. Number five is I want you to weave a mat, M-A-T-T. -T. Now, when you start a company, it's really exciting. It's because you know, everything is new and everything is fresh. New logo, new name, new domain, new website, new employees, new furniture, new office, new business model, new product, everything is exciting. And when everything is exciting, I think you can lose priority. Like, what should you do first? So MATT, M-A-T-T, -T, defines the four most important things. The M in MATT stands for milestones. Milestones are the most important things you need to accomplish. A milestone is something like finishing the product, making the first sale, collecting the first invoice. A milestone is something that you would call up your spouse, your significant other, and say, today we did this. So a milestone is not Today we ordered business cards. That's not a milestone. A milestone is shipping, selling, collecting money. That's the M. The A is you need to carefully delineate the assumptions in your company. How many sales calls can your sales force make? What percentage of unique visitors are going to actually buy something? So you need to come up with those assumptions because you need a reality check, which comes in with the next letter, T, for test. So if you're making this assumption that 5% of the unique visitors who come to your website are going to buy your product, you need to test that assumption. I can tell you right now you're wrong. 5% will not buy it. But when you develop these assumptions, then you have to test them. So that's the T. And the last T is tasks. These tasks are the things that you need to do to finish the milestone, come up with the assumptions, and then test the assumptions. So last priority is these tactical tasks, M-A-T-T. The sixth thing you need to do is to hire infected people. Now, everybody knows you should hire someone who has the right educational background, has the right work experience, 
And I would add a third variable, which is that you are infected with a love, with a passion for what the company does. And arguably, I might make the case that it is more important to hire people who are infected and love what you do than for them to have the correct educational background and the correct work experience. So if you look at my case, when I went to work for Apple, I had an undergraduate degree in psychology, which is the easiest major I could find. I had an MBA in marketing. I did not have a technical course in my entire background. That's still true to this day. Uh, I worked in the jewelry business. Take that again. I worked in the jewelry business. I absolutely did not have anything relevant in my background on paper for a tech job like evangelizing Macintosh. But what really made me effective was that I loved Macintosh. I was totally infected. I thought Macintosh was going to change the world. So I'm not saying you should not hire people with the right education and the right work experience. I would just like you to you know, think outside the box a little bit and consider people who might not have those two perfect qualifications, but love what you do. They are infected. Number seven. Number seven I stole from Chairman Mao, although it's not clear to me that he exactly let this happen, which is let a hundred flowers blossom. This means that you ship your product, you ship your service, you take your best shot at marketing and positioning and branding, but lo and behold, people who you did not expect to be your customers are using your product, they're buying your product, they may even be buying it in large quantities, and you're in shock. My God, the wrong people are buying our product or service. Now you may be tempted to say, well, we need to fix this, we need to get our intended customer using our product or service. God bless you, you can try that, but my recommendation is you let a hundred flowers blossom, man. You declare victory. You say, listen, we thought Macintosh was for spreadsheet, database, and word processing. Come to find out it's for desktop publishing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Declare victory. Say, Macintosh is for desktop publishing. Let a hundred flowers blossom. Number eight in starting a company is you need to get social. Social media is the best thing that ever happened to an entrepreneur because social media, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, all of that is fast and it's free and it's everywhere. You know, when I started companies in the previous century, you had to buy advertising. You had to, you know, suck up to these people. You had to go and go to these expensive trade shows and buy booths and build booths and fly to Las Vegas and do all that kind of stuff. And now, man, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, it is a great world. So get social. You know, from the moment you decide to start a company, start building your social media platform. Because it usually takes a year to ship anything. And in that year, you can't just be engineering. You also have to be social media. You want to have a large social media platform on the day you ship. Okay, so that's number eight. Number nine is to enable people to test drive your product or service. Basically, you're saying to people, I think you're smart. And because I think you're smart, I'm not going to bludgeon you into becoming a customer. Instead, I'm going to let you try this Macintosh, try this piece of software, uh, try this service, and then you conclude. It's basically saying to people, I think you're smart, and because I think you're smart, I'm not going to try to bludgeon you into becoming a customer. I'm going to provide you with information, and then you decide. The last thing, the tenth thing is, don't let the bozos grind you down. The bozos are going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary, no one will buy a personal computer, no one will send a 140 character text message, no one wants to have stupid photo filters and you put dog ears on people and you have you know, pictures and video that disappear after 30 seconds. People are going to tell you that. It can't happen. It won't happen. Nobody. There's no need. There's no proof of it. Ignore those people. I could build a case that Facebook shouldn't have succeeded. I could build a case that Twitter shouldn't have succeeded. Apple shouldn't have succeeded. Basically, every computer success, every tech success, almost every company, you could build a case that it should not have succeeded. This doesn't mean that whenever someone tells you you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. But if someone tells you you'll fail and you believe them and never try, you'll never know. And that's the worst outcome of all. So that's my top 10 in how to start a company. Have at it.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Mike Dutra, and this is our Blackstone Valley. Next up, i uh, got some breaking news. ABC is canceling Roseanne after the star's racist Twitter rant. Uh, ABC canceled its hit sitcom Roseanne on Tuesday after the show's biggest star, Roseanne Barr, went on a racist Twitter rant. Roseanne's Twitter statement is abhorrent, repugnant, and inconsistent with our values, and we have decided to cancel her show, ABC Entertainment President Channing Dungey said in a statement. Uh, this is also originally reported on CNN by Frank Pallotta and Brian Stetler. Um, the cancellation of the show stunned Hollywood. Industry veterans say they've never seen anything like it. The revival of Roseanne premiered with huge ratings just three months ago. Pre-production was already underway for a second season, which was scheduled for Tuesdays at 8 p.m. this fall. But now the show is over. ABC is planning to run a uh, air a repeat of Roseanne Tuesday night, but run uh, the middle in will air in its place. Barr's talent agency, ICM Partners, also dropped her on Tuesday. Uh, what she wrote is antithetical to our core values, both as individuals and as an agency, the agency said in a statement. Consequently, we have notified her that we will not represent her effective immediately. Roseanne Barr is no longer a client. Uh, Barr had no immediate comment on Tuesday afternoon. Barr has had a long uh, history of controversial tweets, including posts about the Trump conspiracy theories, uh, but even by her low standards, Tuesday's marks were egregious. Beyond the pale is how one Disney source put it. In a series of tweets, Barr attacked uh, Valerie uh, Jarrett, Chelsea Clinton, and George Soros. ABC went silent for several hours as it decided what to do. While it took some time to announce the decisions, uh, executives quickly decided to boot the reboot. Uh, when asked about why ABC ultimately decided to cancel the show, a Disney source said, it's a question of right and wrong, and it's a question of our company's values. Reactions to the decision have been overwhelmingly and largely po uh, positive. Congressman John Lewis thanked ABC, saying there is not any room in our society for racism or bigotry. Uh, some things apparently are more important than money, even for a network like ABC, and that's heartening, says CNN's Van Jones on the air. But there will be ripple effects for the, from the cancellation. At least 200 jobs will be affected, according to industry sources. Before ABC pulled the plug, some of Barr's car leaks, uh, colleagues excuse me, had publicly rebuked her. Actress Emma Kenny, who played Roseanne's granddaughter on the reboot, tweeted that she was in the process of quitting the show when she found out that it had been canceled. About an hour and a half before the cancellation uh, was announced, one of the show's consulting producers, Wanda Sykes, uh, said she was done with it and she would not be returning to Roseanne on ABC, she tweeted. And Sarah Gilbert, who played Barr's daughter on the ABC sitcom, tweeted that Barr's comments are abhorrent, abhorrent and do not reflect the beliefs of our cast and crew or anyone else associated with our show. Gilbert added, This is incredibly sad and difficult for all of us, and we've created a show that we believe in and are proud of and that the audiences love, one that is separate and apart from the opinions and words of one cast member. Uh, what Barr said exactly on Twitter. In one of the tweets, she wrote, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals VJ. Barr was responding to a comment about Valerie Jarrett, a top former aide to President Obama. She claimed she was joking, but then deleted the tweet and issued an apology to Jarrett and all Americans. I am truly sorry for making a bad joke about her politics and her look, Barr tweeted. I should have known better. Forgive me. My joke was in bad taste. Uh, another uh, large... Uh, group of tweets we don't need to get into, but uh, why did ABC revive Roseanne? Um, in the past, ABC executives had privately said they had held their noses when Barr tweeted, they knew some of her posts had been problematic, and they had urged her to concentrate on the sitcom reboot. But they essentially decided the rewards of hiring Barr were outweighed for the potential risks. Um, we as a country feel you on that, ABC. We feel that that was a mistake as well. We understand. For a while, they were right. The Roseanne revival was one of the highest rated new shows of the season. About 18 million live viewers watched the, pre, uh, the premiere episode in March. Barr was restored as one of the network's biggest stars, just like she was 20 years ago. This story rings somewhere in America. Somewhere. If only we could figure that out, people. Uh, Barr is a supporter of President Trump in real life, and on the show, Trump praised the debut, saying over 18 million 
and it was about us. He also called Barr to congratulate her. Uh, later, the show uh, saw its audience come back down to earth, but the finale still grabbed 10 million views. Uh, that's why it's hard to imagine Roseanne being canceled on Tuesday. But Disney believed it had to take some action. There were both cultural and financial factors to consider. It was clear that some major advertisers would likely shun Roseanne in the future. Enough was enough, the Disney source said. You're not alone, Disney. A lot of us feel like enough is enough with this type of behavior. I'm Mike Dutra. This is our Blackstone Valley. We'll be right back. This car wash gives people with autism the capability to use their attributes to have a life of fulfillment and self-empowerment through employment. None of our guys look to get out of work. My name is John Derry, and I founded this car wash in Florida to create as full a life as I can for my son with autism. People with autism embrace the structured environment. They like to do it the same way over and over again. They really enjoy what they're doing. They listen so well. They care about the customer feedback. And our guys are inspired by the people around them. They learn it's very important to motor forward, and they use it here. Unemployment among people with autism is at least 90%. But we're sending a positive message into our community. People with autism can do good work. Maybe you should give them a shot. They earn. They do not get carried. And that gives them a sense of pride. The impact is, oh my God, look at this and how powerful it is. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Mike Dutra, and this is our Blackstone Valley. Uh, very quickly, with the few moments we have left, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, young men and women that are working with us at our Northbridge, uh, first of which is Sabrina. Sabrina's running our Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Division. Uh, a little story about her, if I could tell it from her own perspective. Uh, this is from Sabrina. One day when I came into the office, a woman was sitting there discussing the issue she was having at home with a couple of members of our office. She expressed the difficulties she had in getting help and even how she was uh, even more worried what would happen with all of the changes that might come. She opened up about her home life and how she was being abused. Uh, Sabrina said, we now talk every day and uh, I can see how much improvement she's already had in her own life and her own happiness. Uh, Sabrina continues, I hope sharing this with people will help others to come forward. Uh, she wants to make it so uh, people know that this does happen everywhere, even in our great town of Northbridge. Uh, she wants to help those that, uh, that are where she was once. She, she was once in their shoes as well, and good for you for having the, the courage to talk about that, Sabrina. We salute you. And lastly, she wants to give people their confidence back, which is one thing I thoroughly believe in. Uh, any type of oppression, people need to, uh, to get their self-esteem back afterwards, and certainly with uh, the good work that Sabrina is doing, with our Northbridge and the Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Division does not go unnoticed. Uh, thank you so much, Sabrina. Secondly, I wanted to quickly mention Randy. Uh, Randy gave me a quick write-up as well. She's a mom of two, uh, a two-year-old and a 22-year-old. A <laughs> no. She's got two little uh, beautiful children. Um, she's always collected baby stuff and has given it to her friends when she had a chance to make it more official by helping uh, our Northbridge and thereby creating her division, which is Helping Hands, it was an amazing opportunity for her to uh, spread the help amongst others beyond uh, her own friends and family. Uh, lastly, I, I wanted to quickly mention Valerie. Uh, Valerie is actually running the political division here at our Northbridge. She's going to help make it possible for us to pull papers on every vacant position in town for the next November election. Uh, if you're over the 18, uh, 18 years of age and would like to, to get involved in, in politics, reach out to me and Valerie at our Northbridge at 101 Church Street. We want to get you engaged. We do not want to see 8% voter turnout ever again. Um, we should, there's no reason we can't double voter turnout for the next election. All that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name's Mike Dutra. You have a great night.